As Pastor Mike said, I work for a ministry called Every Home for Christ. And at Every Home for Christ, we believe that the gospel is inherently powerful enough, that the love of Jesus is inherently hopeful enough, that it should go to every single person on the planet without exception. If you agree, say amen. Amen. So we've spent a lot of time going into the hardest and darkest places on the planet for the past 75 years, uh, introducing Jesus to people in places where they did not already know the name of Jesus Christ. We are sending missionaries and pioneer missionaries, uh, people you know from certain countries into places in their own uh, nations to share the gospel where the gospel has not already been preached. Uh, this morning in the Himalayan mountains, uh, there is a pioneer missionary that will wake up and will climb the mountains to a village that has never heard the name of Jesus Christ. And today, someone will wake up, uh, and they will be introduced to one of these missionaries, and they will hear the name of Jesus for the very first time. And tonight, they will lay their head on their pillow, knowing that their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, having never heard the name of Jesus before this morning, but because somebody went where the gospel was not already being preached. Amen? And the same thing is happening in the little villages, uh, in the little islands in in the Maldives, in the Pacific Ocean, where one of our pioneer missionaries is going to get in a canoe and paddle to an island that has, we're talking about 99.99% unreached, having 2,000 inhabited islands, 24 million people that have never heard the name of Jesus. And in some situations, they'll take one of those airplanes that land on the water, and they'll get out, and they will introduce Jesus to people who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ before. And this is happening all over the world in tens of thousands of homes every single day. So far, we've engaged over 4 billion people with the gospel. Uh, And all to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, a couple years ago, our president, Dick Eastman, he uh, was hearing from the Lord, and he decided that now was the right time to invest in churches in the United States. So our organization is 75 years old, but we've never really done anything in the United States as far as spending missions dollars. And when we decided to partner with churches in the U.S., like we're doing today, Uh, we decided to do some research, and we found out that 85% of the people in our churches, now that's just statistically across the board. I'm sure your church is above average um, when it comes to things, but just statistically, 85% of the people in this room have barriers preventing them, us, from sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, People say, it is important to me, I know that I should talk to people about Jesus. I know that I should share the gospel. People are praying for opportunities. People say that they are willing to go, but by and large, we are not doing that. And that's because we have barriers standing in our way. So what I want to do today is, it's it's a big task, but I thank God that I'm not alone in this task. We're going to do this together (laughs) and with the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, I want to talk about some of those obstacles And then what we can do to break through those barriers. And amen. And I know it's not by might nor by power, but by the spirit of the living God. So we're not alone on this. But here's what some people said in the survey. One of the top responses when they said, you know, and this was a a Barna research study. So this was like a, you know, a big deal. It was a scientific study. They said, I don't want to be pushy. That was the top obstacle or barrier standing in people's way. You might know somebody who's an atheist and they don't believe that there is a God. Or you might know somebody who is a different world religion. And you don't want to hinder that relationship. And you don't want to be pushy. So you choose to not open your mouth at all in in hopes of saving that relationship. Uh, Another obstacle was, I don't know what to say. Or I'm not good at it. Did you know one of the top barriers is shame. People say, I'm not qualified. They say, Pastor, if you knew what I've done in my past, you would understand I shouldn't be the spokesperson for Christianity. Uh, let, let Pastor Mike do that. Let David do that because, you know, he's got the haircut for it and <laughs> he's got <laughs> the look and he doesn't have my track record, you know, or my prison record or my divorce record or my whatever. He's, let him be the spokesperson. I'm, you, you don't want me. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 4. We're going to look at what these obstacles are in light of Scripture. 
and then figure out where we fit in this. And, and just to cut to the, to the end, why these obstacles don't need to stand in your way. All righty. Uh, so for time's sake, I'm going to do a little paraphrasing. I'm going to do a little bit of reading. Uh, I wish I could read the whole chapter, but I just want to highlight a few verses. Um, and then I think you have them. If you want to just uh, put them up there, uh, it's a little blinding. All right, so <laughs> I'll just read my Bible. Uh, so John chapter 4 is where Jesus goes to um, Samaria. He left Judea and went again to Galilee. He, this is verse 3, and now going to verse 4. He had to travel through Samaria. And let me stop right there. You're probably familiar enough with the story to know that when it says he had to travel through Samaria, doesn't mean that that was the only way to get to Galilee. There was actually a more popular way for Jewish people to travel to Galilee, and that was to go around Samaria, <laughs> to go around the people uh, that weren't exactly like them. Uh, it, because it says, it, it, going on, you'll, you'll read that the people in Samaria weren't exactly loved or accepted by Jewish people, especially Jewish men. But sometimes to, to, we need to go out of our way to encounter people who are far from God. We need to go out of our way to encounter people who are not like us. You know, I don't know if you live and work with believers every day, but if you do, you might tell yourself, you know, Pastor, that message was, was really great, and I loved it, but I just don't know a lot of unbelievers. I don't know a lot of people who are far from God. Now, you might be married to somebody who's far from God, and that doesn't apply to you because you see people every day. You work with people every day. You go to school with people every day, but some of you, might say, I just don't know a lot of lost people. Well, remind yourself, verse 4 says that he had to go through Samaria. We need to go out of our way to encounter lost people sometime. So he encountered this woman, verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and she said, give me a drink. Jesus said to her, you know, her disciples had gone to buy food. Um, and then she says, how is it that you, a Jew, asking for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. And so they have a little dialogue here. And now Jesus being a prophet, having a gift of knowledge from the Holy Spirit says, verse 16, go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You said correctly, you don't have a husband. Jesus said, for you've had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And so they go back and forth talking about living water and how Jesus wants to offer something that is so much better than this water that's here in the well. And he is expressing love and he's expressing, um, you know, concern for this woman. And then the woman uh, receives this living water. She's excited about what it is that he has. And then to, to kind of wrap things up with the scriptures here, um, verse 28 says, Then the woman left her water jar went into town and told the men, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? So they left their town and made their way to him. And basically the entire town comes to know Jesus that day. They come to hear him. They invite him to stay. And it really becomes uh, a monumental moment for that community. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for your word that is anointed. God, I pray that you would anoint my words now, that you would use me, Lord, but even choose to, I pray that, God, that you would speak directly to each person here, even bypassing what I'm saying, Lord, and Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts and show us how this message should affect us. In Jesus' name, amen. People say, I don't want to be pushy. I don't know what to say. I'm not good at it. I have shame. We can see all of those different obstacles right here in this passage, starting with Jesus. What was his posture? Was his posture pushy? Was, he, was his posture out of um, judgment and condemnation? No. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world would be saved, John 3, 17. And when he came to this woman, yes, sure, he did address her sin, and that's not necessarily the approach where we need to start with, like, hey, ma'am, uh, I see that you are sinning, and I'm going to tell you all the sins that you have, <laughs> like, that's not, like, that's not, the, that's not what Jesus is trying to show here. He's trying to say, you know what, ma'am, in spite of the sin and the reasons why you think that you are 
you know, here at this well at this time and hour, I still love you. I still care about you. Um, and he was, uh, his posture was love, so he wasn't pushy. When it comes to what, what do I say, you know, or I'm not good at it. You know, I'm personally grateful when it comes to this story in John chapter 4. I don't know about you, but the woman that was at the well here at this time, you know, I'm grateful that before she went into this community and she completely uh, changed the community for the glory of God, I'm grateful that she had a seminary to go to and, and a Bible college before that and a Sunday school before that and a church to be a part of before that, you know, because if she didn't have those things, there's no way she could have impacted the whole town the way that she did. Okay, well, maybe went a little far with the sarcasm, but um, you get it, right? <laughs> she just shared her experience. I don't know if you know what the Romans road is, but it's a series of scriptures in the book of Romans where, and I can tell them to you here in just a minute. I mean, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. That's the Romans road, and if you share those uh, scriptures with somebody who believes that the Bible is God's word, then you can explain the plan of salvation. This woman at the well didn't have the Romans road memorized. The book of Romans had not been written, and the apostle Paul was still called Saul, if he had even been born yet. I'm not good on the time frame, but he wasn't even a Christian. <laughs> she didn't know the Romans road. So don't let that be your excuse. I don't know what to say. I can't rattle off four or five verses like that. Neither could this lady. She simply shared her experience. One of our slogans at Every Home for Christ is one of the songs that you sang, and that's Jesus changes everything. And Jesus changed everything in that moment for this woman because she went into this community and she shared her experience. Now, I hope you're taking notes today, and I hope you wrote down the Romans Road. And personally, I hope you memorize those scriptures. They've literally changed my life, and as I've shared them with lots of other people, it's really changed their lives. I've been able to, when I was in middle school, I learned that it was my responsibility to share the gospel with other people. I was born and raised in my grandpa's church. I'm a sixth-generation Pentecostal preacher, and my second cousin introduced me to uh, evangelism and telling me how to do that. And the way he taught me to do that was through the Romans Road. But if you don't know the Romans Road, you can still share your experience with Jesus Christ. Now, don't, you know, memorize it. <laughs> but if you don't, <laughs> then you can still do it. What about shame? People say, you know, Pastor, if you knew my story, if you knew what I've done, then you would understand that I'm not really the one that should be representing Jesus Christ. I'm not really the good spokesperson. I think Jesus had to go through Samaria because he didn't want to just meet a Samaritan. I think maybe God had a divine appointment with this Samaritan woman at the well. And I think not only was he trying to make a point, but God really did care about this woman in particular. <laughs> but he was trying to make a point as well, that if this woman could do it, then anybody can do it. For instance, I think the reason that it says that she was at the well at the sixth hour, which was six hours after the sun came up, so that was noon, okay? She was there in the heat of the day because it was significant. Most of the time when things are written in the Bible, it's because there's something significant about it. If everybody went to the well at the sixth hour at noon, then it probably wouldn't have made it into the Holy Scripture. I think there was a point to it. And I think it was maybe because it was hot at that time. And I can't prove all of this, but it's pretty much a common understanding that it would have been normal for people to go to the well in the cool of the day, in the morning, when it was more pleasant to, uh, to, to get the water. But this woman may not have wanted to go to the well when everybody else was there, because who knows who else was there? There may have been some other men there that she used to be married to. <laughs> That would have been awkward. She, she may, there may have other women there that she at one time was married to somebody that they are now married to or were previously married to before she entered the picture. That would, let me put it like this. 
sometimes I do choose to go uh, into Starbucks. All right? You like Starbucks, right? All right. And so what if this morning I... Uh, I did go to Starbucks this morning. What if I what if I went to go in? Actually, you know, I said I drove through, but I, I went in. And um, I went in because I brought my own cup. Now, if I had gone into the Starbucks and I saw five of my ex-girlfriends inside <laughs> talking to each other, okay, I'm definitely going to go through the drive-thru, all right? <laughs> That's basically what's happening here, <laughs> but like on a bigger scale. And it's not like I've had five ex-girlfriends. I mean, just charity is my one and only love. For life, and that's all we care to talk about. <laughs> all the other girls were blocked on Instagram, and uh, <laughs> but anyway, that's what's happening here. You know what I find fascinating? When this woman goes into the the town to Sychar, the town in Samaria, and she broadcasts something. She says, "Come see a man who what." Come see a man who performed a miracle. Come see a man who gave a word of knowledge. That's not what she said. Come see a man who can heal the sick. Yes, Jesus can heal the sick. But that is not what she broadcast. My wife pointed this out to me. She said the very same thing that this woman used to hide from, which was her reputation and her past, was the very same thing that she chose to broadcast. She said, come see a man who what? Who told me everything I ever did. What did she do? She was ashamed of her past. She used to hide from her past. And now she's telling the whole town about her past? How is that? It's because Jesus changes everything. And Jesus removed her shame. And if Jesus can remove her shame, someone who had been divorced five times and now was living with a man and so ashamed that she had to go to the well in the heat of the day, and now she's broadcasting, guess what? This man healed me. This man took away my shame. This man revealed, you got to come see a man who told me everything I ever did. He can remove your shame too. So if you are ashamed of the things that you've done in the past, if you are ashamed of the lifestyle that you have lived or even sins that you struggle with today, let me tell you this, that one encounter with Jesus changes everything. And he can and he will and he wants to remove your shame today. So don't let that stop you anymore. And let, and let, let that be your testimony. And if you don't know what to say, that was one of the last obstacles I was going to share with you today. If you don't know what to say, then just share your testimony. Talk about how Jesus has changed your life. Try to throw in one of those scriptures from Romans, just for my second cousin, because it'd make him proud and make me proud. But just share your testimony. Let me show you kind of what this looks like. I've talked about some of those obstacles, but now let's get a little bit more practical, okay? Turn to Luke uh, chapter 10, please. And um, I have these scriptures up on the board. Let's look at verses 2 and 3. Jesus is commissioning some of his disciples, actually 72 of them. And he says, he told them, the harvest is abundant or plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. Now go, I am sending you. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if you cared about people who are far from God? And then what if Jesus gave you some kind of formula? What if Jesus said, all right, if you care about the lost, then do this and you will see progress in reaching lost people. When I say lost people, I'm talking about non-Christians, people who are far from God, people who are not in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That would be pretty cool, right? I'm not like a formulaic kind of guy, like, oh, do this and that. But like, this is kind of what's happening here. Jesus says, guess what? The harvest is plentiful. There are a lot of lost people out there, and the workers are few. Therefore, get together on Sundays and talk about how you can reach them. No, that's not what he says. Therefore, pray. Pray. So if I had points today, point number one would be pray. All right? We need to pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest if he not send forth the laborers into the harvest field. I think that's the first thing that we need to do. And don't forget point number uh, two, which is verse three. As much as we need to pray for the lost, and I'm going to share a story here how I pray for the lost. 
but it's also going to be about how I, number two, engage, which is the, the point number two that we need to do is engage the lost. Verse three says, now go, I am sending you. So you can actually be the answer to that prayer. So I'm all for prayer. And some people say, you know, that's, that's, that's what we need to do. But that's not all we need to do. I'd like to show you what this could look like in your life and what it looked like in my life when I first moved to North Carolina. I'm originally from Omaha, Nebraska. I lived in Iowa for several years, seven years actually. And um, I moved to North Carolina about 13 years ago. And I love being in North Carolina and I'm never moving back. Um, <laughs> mainly because it's so cold back there. And then in the summertime, it's so hot. But, and you don't have the beach or the, the mountains. So really, there's no reason to move back. <laughs> and my family's all here. So here I am. I was a really proud bachelor when I moved here. And I bought a house. And I've always taken things literally, painfully literally at times. And when I bought a house in Hickory, there's a little uh, neighboring community called Longview just right next to Hickory. And I learned the scripture that says, love your neighbor as yourself. I just took that literally. Now, you know, the question like the Pharisees would ask, you know, who is my neighbor? And Jesus is basically like, it's basically everybody, if you're traveling on a road and you meet somebody, that's your neighbor. But still, my neighbor is my next door neighbor because I just couldn't get away from that. Sure, it's the traveler and all those other people. But when I found out that my next door neighbors were Buddhist, that they had moved to North Carolina from Thailand and they barely spoke English and they certainly didn't know Christianity or Jesus, it, it bothered me in a sense that I felt a burden to pray for them. I felt a heart, a longing for them to know the kind of hope that I have for eternity and also for their eternity to be impacted in a positive way. And I didn't care if God used me to do it or somebody else, but I just really didn't want my neighbors uh, to continue to be Buddhist and live next door to me. It was kind of like this conflict. Um, and so I began to pray for them every day. The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, therefore pray. So I prayed for them. But I also did one other thing. Twice a year, I would go to their house, and I would knock on their door, and I'd basically invite them to church or try to build a relationship with them in some way. And as you leave here today, you're going to pick up um, a little kit. It's called a personal outreach kit. It's for you, and it's free. And inside there are some engagers. Now, I had these engagers as well. They're basically conversation starters. They help introduce people to Jesus in like a written form. And I didn't know what Every Home for Christ was. I didn't know they were called engagers. But Every Home had sent them to our church. And I liked them. So I started giving them away. <laughs> and they were Christmas engagers. And I said, I knocked on my neighbor's uh, door. It was the week before Christmas. And I said, hey. I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, my name is Marcus, and I live right next door. And I just wanted to say Merry Christmas, and here uh, are some Christmas cookies. Uh, now, at the time, they were just break and bake cookies. <laughs> uh, nothing special at all. I mean, they taste better than if I would have tried to make them from scratch. But I just, I was a bachelor, and I just bought the things, broke them, put them in the oven, and 12 minutes later, I was at my neighbor's house, and they were still warm. And I had an engager, and I, and I flipped the engager over, and I said, oh, and by the way, this Sunday, we're doing something special uh, for Christmas. All the kids are getting Christmas presents, and we're going to have cookies, and we're going to have, you know, there's a theme here with the cookies, but um, <laughs> whatever it was, you know, honestly, like our choir was doing something special. This was like 13 years ago when we still had choir, and, um, and that was it. And then I went to the other homes as well, not just my immediate next door neighbors, but I went all the way through the thing. And they didn't come to church the next Sunday. But several months passed, and it was the Saturday, the day before Easter, and I went back. But this time I took some little uh, marshmallow peeps, you know, the little chick things, and I had an Easter engager, you know, taped to it. And I said, hey, you remember me, Marcus? Yeah, I live next door. I, I just wanted to say happy Easter. And... Um, Tomorrow is Easter, and if you're not doing anything, I'm going to save you a seat uh, if, if you want me to. And I'd be, I'd be honored if you'd come sit by me. And it was a non-threatening, you know, we didn't get into apologetics, which is defending the faith and proving why Christianity is right and Buddhism is wrong. Like, that wasn't my approach. Um, I was just kind of trying to be nice. 
And I did that for six or seven years <laughs> with all of my neighbors. And when people ask me, Marcus, how did you get Buddhist people to start coming to your church? And, and they only visited a couple times. But I said, you know, I didn't like get them to come to my church, like convince them in any way. All I did was uh, pray for them for, you know, every day for six or seven years. <laughs> and twice a year, I invited them to church. So, like, if you are entry level, you've never opened your mouth to talk about Jesus, then, like, my goal for you would be maybe just start praying for your neighbors and maybe twice a year invite them to church. Like, if you can't do anything else, maybe start there. Is that a good starting place? Okay, that's a good starting place. For some of you more advanced, whatever, we'll get to your task here in a minute. But, like, maybe that's what we could all do at a minimum. When the husband and father in that home passed away, I realized that I had never actually articulately uh, explained the plan of salvation, the Romans road, if you will, uh, to him. And that really bothered me. I had invited him to church, but I don't know that the name Jesus ever actually came out of my mouth to where he could hear. And I know that Jesus is the only way to the Father, and that this man may have believed in God or gods, but I don't believe that that gets him to the Father. I believe that there is only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So it's really important to talk about Jesus and introduce people to Jesus. And I had failed, I guess, if you want to use that word, in that attempt with this family, and that really bothered me. So I just continued to pray, and I continued to engage, and I continued to look for opportunities to serve. And when the mother and wife or widow uh, came over to my house asking me, Marcus, um, could you please fix the lawnmower in, in my front yard? It stopped working. Um, I said, absolutely. I'll do whatever I can do. So I went over there. And it might be important to note that, you know, I know we just met. Um, but if you know anything about me at all, you know that I know nothing about small engines, okay? <laughs> That's like a need to know. <laughs> Don't ask me to help fix your lawnmower. I hate to admit it, but I've never changed my own oil. I've never changed a spare tire. I have AAA, all right? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a degree in, like, mechanics. I can tell you about the gospel. You know, I can do it, but I can't. And, but I said, absolutely, I'm going to look for opportunities to serve. And so I went over there. And I said a little prayer. We're Pentecostal here, right? So I believe in miracles. You know, it's harder to say this in some other churches. But I said, <laughs> I believe in, I believe God can do supernatural. <laughs> and so I grabbed the lawnmower, and I pulled it as hard as I could, the little pole chain. I pulled it as fast as I could, as pulled it as many times as I could. And by the grace of God, we got the lawnmower to start. Amen? <laughs> and when she said, you know, Marcus, can you, uh, my husband used to take care of the bushes in between our house. Uh, would you be able to um, help with that since my husband's obviously not here to do that. I said, oh yeah, I'm sorry that you even had to ask. It'd be my pleasure. Uh, so I got on my eight, nine foot ladder and, and I got a chainsaw and I'm up there trying to like, <laughs> for the glory of God, just like cut the bushes down. And when she invited me into her home for the first time, because I had, you know, gone to the door and knocked and whatnot, but I had never actually come inside the house. Um, she wanted me to hang blinds and at the time had never used a power tool, okay? Um, I have since remodeled the house. Lest you think that I'm not a man or masculine, I have flipped a house and used many power tools, and I purchased a truck. That truck broke, and I didn't know how to fix it, so I sold it. But, <laughs> but I've owned a truck, so I am a man. Um, and <laughs> no offense to the Prius drivers or anything. But um, anyway, uh, we're in North Charlotte, so it's probably... Prius drivers here. Okay. Anyway, you're a man too. All right. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, I, I, I helped her hang the blinds in her house because, okay, uh, I, I learned a term. It's called servanthood evangelism. I didn't know the term at the time. There's actually a name for this. I was just trying to be nice. Um, and I asked the young adult daughter about the idols that I saw in her home. Actual, literal, what you think of in the Bible, idols cultural things I was not familiar with. And I asked about it. I said, what's this and this and this? And she said, oh, these are, she didn't call them idols, obviously, but she said, my mom bows down to these statues and she prays to them three times a day. I said, wow, this is happening right next door to me in North Carolina. 
And so I began to pray even harder. <laughs> and, um, you know, I can tell you this. I wish I could tell you that this family uh, got saved and that they got baptized and that now they are leading the New Believers class at our church in Hickory. I wish I could tell you that, but I can't tell you that because none of that's happened. To, to my knowledge, that's not happening. But, but what I can tell you is this. The um, young adult children uh, have come to the young adult Bible study that I was hosting at my house where we studied who is Jesus. And they got to hear about Jesus. They got to hear about God's plan for their life, the redemptive process. The family did come to our church a couple times. My dad's the pastor. He preached Jesus. He explained God's plan. He explained salvation to this family. I wish I could say that they, you know, are leadership in our church, but I can't say that. But what I can say is I was able to plant a seed where there was no seed at all. They did not know Jesus. They did not know of Jesus. They had heard of Christmas. Maybe they had heard of Easter, but that was about it. But now they know at least who Jesus is. You see, in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 6, it says that I planted and Apollos watered, but God has been making it grow. Some people plant a seed. Some people water a seed, but it is God that makes the fruit grow. So it is not our responsibility to save a soul, nor is it our ability to save a soul. I remember when I was middle school, I told you I was super excited about sharing the gospel with people. And my grandpa was the pastor. And it was Wednesday night, and we had a testimony service. I don't know if you had a testimony service. And he said, does anybody have a testimony? And as proud as I could be, I walked up to the front, and I grabbed the microphone. And I said, I have a testimony. <laughs> Got a little smirk on my face. And um, I've always been really humble. Um, <laughs> I'm really proud of that. And um, <laughs> I grabbed the microphone, and I said, Today at school, I saved four people. <laughs> and you know what? I, you, you know my mom, so this might not surprise you. Um, she sat me down, and she said, Marcus, you didn't save four people at school today. Uh, you've never saved anyone, and you can't save anyone. You will never save anyone because you are not Jesus Christ. You did not die for anyone's sins, so you do not have the ability to save anybody, and I never want to hear you say that you saved anyone ever again. I thought she might say congratulations, <laughs> but instead I got all that, but I never made that mistake again that I had the ability to save someone. Only Jesus Christ can save someone from their sins. But that should allow us to take a deep breath and realize that, you know what, we can plant a seed, we can water a seed, but we can't save anyone. So for the Buddhist neighbors that I have, it is not my fault, nor is it to my credit, if they make a decision to follow Jesus Christ or don't make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. I can't take credit for that if I see them in heaven, and I, I can't be blamed for that if I don't. I can still pray for them, and I can still plant seeds, and I can still water seeds. But I can tell you today that there is a seed planted where there was no seed planted. I don't live next door to them anymore. I pray that my, uh, the person that bought my house is continuing to water that seed. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we get to see uh, a seed planted. Sometimes we get to, to water the seed. I remember when the, um, the, uh, the Hispanic family, they were a Mexican family that moved to North Carolina, next door to the Buddhist family from Mexico. They barely spoke English again. And um, they were Catholic, and they feared God. They loved God. But I remember the night that the, uh, the father came over to my house with a pen and paper in his hand because of the language barrier. He was trying to communicate, and he had to write some things down. And he said, can you please pray for my son who has run away from home, and he ran away from the Lord? And he's getting involved in a lifestyle that doesn't please God and doesn't please me and is dangerous. And I remember saying, oh, absolutely. I'm already praying for you. I'm going to add that. I'm going to pray specifically. And I remember when Ed started coming to our youth group and he started getting set free from those addictive substances that he was getting involved in. And God began to work in his life. Sometimes we plant a seed. Sometimes we water a seed. And sometimes we actually get to see God produce the fruit. Amen. 
and then right uh, across, right, right in the, the base, their shared backyards was uh, a family who, I guess you could say, were Southern Baptist, but they hadn't been involved in church for years. They were hurt or wounded by their previous church, and for six or seven years, I had just been inviting them to church as casually and as like non-confrontationally as possible. And I always had cookies with me. <laughs> It always helps. That's just like a pro tip, like bring cookies. <laughs> like if you're not sure like what to do. Also, if there's something happening at your church, you know, like if you have a special event coming, like like especially if it's a holiday or even if it's just we're going to have a candlelight service on Christmas Eve, whatever. Maybe they're lonely. Maybe it's a widow and she doesn't have anyone to spend Christmas Eve with, you know, just whatever. You, it could be a random Sunday. You could do this this week and, you know, come, we're starting a new series on the book of Acts, you know, whatever. It doesn't. This is just like helpful tips. Um, And I remember the day that Kathy uh, drove in front of my house, and I was mowing the grass with my lawnmower, which was working just fine. And she stopped the car, and I stopped the lawnmower, and she rolled the window down, and I walked over to her, and I said, hey, Kathy, what's going on? And um, she was real hesitant, like nervous, almost almost like a jittery. And she looked at her daughter, Stephanie, and she looked back at me, and she kind of like took a deep breath and she said, I said, what's going on, Kathy? How can I help you? What do you need? And, and she said, um, we were just wondering, would, would you mind inviting us to your church again? <laughs> and I said, I don't mind at all. And I thought to myself, I've been inviting you to church for six or seven years. But yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, invitation still stands. But I didn't say all that out loud. It would have been offensive. <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, please come. And I explained, you know, when our service times were and where it was located. And she knew all that already. But she came and she not only uh, visited our church, but she became members of our church. And uh, she brought her husband and her children and her grandchildren and her cousins and her second cousins and her nieces <laughs> and other neighbors. And she started bringing all kinds of people. And she had a home. And this time, when breast cancer returned for the third time, she wasn't alone. She had a family of believers to stand with her in that really, really difficult journey, and it's still a really difficult uh, health battle for her. But she knows that she is loved, and that she has people praying for her. I'll give you one more story about my neighborhood. Right across the street from me was a family who I guess you could say identified as Jehovah's Witness. But again, they hadn't been a part of any uh, religious services for a really long time based on their interest and also their work schedules. They had just basically stayed at home without going to any church or religious services. And multiple times in front of this house, while I lived in my house, uh, I would see an ambulance in front of the home. Not because of accidents or anything like that, but because of panic attacks and anxiety. It was debilitating to the point they had to call emergency services. And I remember the night the young adult daughter came over to my home, and we stood in the driveway talking, and she asked me to pray for her. She said, can you pray for me because I'm dealing with panic attacks and anxiety? She didn't know what else to do. Jehovah's Witness asking me to come pray for her. So I did pray for her. And when I pray for people, you know, we we looked at Luke chapter 10, but if you look at verse 5, it said, when you enter a house, first speak peace, say peace to this home. So I try to incorporate the peace of God uh, into basically any time I'm praying for people. You know, when we go home to home, actually like, as like a mission, like, hey, guys, we're going to go uh, knock on doors today, that kind of thing. I always try to, you know, I say, hey, Mar- I'm, I'm, my name is Marcus. I'm from the prayer team at our church. It's really the evangelism team. <laughs> But I say it's a prayer team because we are praying for them. It's just like a half truth, so it's not really a lie, right? <laughs> our our T-shirts say prayer team. It, it'd be weird if it said like I'm gonna convert you to Christianity team. Like it's just a tactic. Um, <laughs> but I always try to incorporate peace. And in the same way with Kristen here, my ne- my next door neighbor, she lived across the street. You know, she knew about Jesus. There was a seed planted. There was a seed watered, I guess, if you will. But she did not know Jesus the way I knew Jesus. I was able to tell her, like I'm able to tell so many people, you know, ma'am, I don't know what it's like to be in your situation. When a mother tells me, and this has happened three times in like recent months, um, I have a son that's in, in prison. 
and we're all kind of nervous. I tell her, I don't know what that's like to be in your situation. But when I'm in situations like yours, I find my peace from Jesus Christ. This is like a, a strategy that you can use to transition a regular conversation about somebody's need into a conversation about Jesus. I say, the Bible even calls him the Prince of Peace. What's your relationship like with Jesus? And I allow that person to share whatever it is they want to share. They may have been hurt from a church. They may have some other world belief. I don't try to judge them. I just try to say, I try to listen. And then I share my experience, like the woman at the well shared her experience with Jesus. She wasn't arguing with anybody about their philosophy on Jewish messiahs or anything. She was just sharing her experience. And I can share my experience, and I can share that Jesus Christ gives me peace. When I lost my job in the middle of COVID, and I got laid off last March, and I didn't know how we were going to pay, and thank God for Second Harvest Food Pantry, because I was shopping at Second Harvest Food Pantry, and I was volunteering, but I was like taking what's mine as well. And I said, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory, and I know that my God is my provider, and I did not worry, I did not fear, because Jesus Christ gave me peace in the middle of my battle. I can share my story. And you can't really argue with my experience. You can disagree with my interpretation or whatever, but I can share my story. And then I can say this. Would you like to know that kind of peace? Not only for this situation that we're talking about, but for eternity, like forever in heaven. And so... Um, Kristen, she did start coming to our young adult small group and our, our youth group, and her brother got plugged into our youth group. And sometimes we plant a seed, sometimes we water a seed, and sometimes uh, we get to see God make the fruit grow, and we actually get to see that harvest. My point in saying all of that is to please pray for your neighbors and maybe systematically engage them. And maybe you can commit to engaging in just one spiritual conversation a week for the course of over the next year. I'm not saying you need to lead one person to the Lord every week. It'd be great if you did, but that's not your responsibility, nor is it your ability. But what if you just engaged in, in, in those spiritual conversations? I think that that would be wonderful. In closing here, I want to tell you the um, three unalterable convictions that we have at Every Home for Christ. Uh, number one is we believe the Great Commission, which is to share the gospel with the world, uh, we believe that the Great Commission must be taken literally, which is great for me because I'm a literal person anyway. And when the Bible says go into all the world, uh, all means all, and that's all all means. Heard that. Read that on Instagram last week. I was like, that's good. <laughs> it's not the Bible, but it's good. Um, <laughs> you can follow me on Instagram, at Marcus Dolphins, with an E, not an I. Anyway, a little plug. Um, <laughs> So we believe that you need to take the Great Commission literally. It's not a figurative thing. Point number two, um, we believe that without unity, this task, the Great Commission, is impossible. That's why I'm here today. Every Home for Christ has offices in 165 nations around the world. But we certainly don't have enough staff members to single-handedly, as an organization, knock on every door. We've knocked on two billion doors, and we've given away four billion pieces of gospel literature over the past 75 years, but none of that was just done by ourselves. I'm partnering here with you today. This is to say cross-denominationally, uh, with cross-churches, with, with different uh, generations, different ethnicities, we need to partner together in unity so that we can reach every single person on the planet with the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? And the last point, point number three, um, of our unalterable convictions is that prayer alone will remove any obstacle standing in the way of completing this task. And this is a ministry that is based on prayer. Uh, our foundation is prayer. And that's probably why that's written the way that that is. But when I started working for Every Home for Christ a few years ago, uh, that word alone kind of bothered me. I was like, prayer alone will remove every obstacle? Well, what about like prayer and hard work or prayer and creativity or prayer and prayer and what? And I, I said, all right, God, I'm going to put you to the test. I'm a person of faith. And so I'm just going to believe that what you said is true. And I'll just pray. You show me the obstacle. And I'm going to pray that that obstacle is removed. And then, then the end will come. Then we'll, show, we'll reach every person on the planet. 
But if it's, if it's hard work and creativity, then, hey, we're going to have to rewrite that unalterable. <laughs> we're going to have to alter that unalterable <laughs> conviction. And I remember right where I was. I was sitting right in the middle of the uh, auditorium at our church in Hickory. It was a staff meeting, but we had a prayer meeting before the staff meeting. And um, I said, God, what's the obstacle? And the first thing that came to my mind uh, in the little outreach kit that you're going to get, if you open it up, there's information about an app. And it'll help you reach your neighbors and every home and whatnot. And it's a pretty cool app. And the first thing that came to mind was, it's the app. We need a better app. Like, that's the one obstacle stopping us from reaching every person on the planet is a little iPhone app or Android, if you're not yet converted. And whatever. <laughs> and God said, it's, Marcus, it's not the app. And I said, oh, it's the endangers. You know, the little pieces of gospel literature that we have in the kit? If they were just a little trendier, if they were a little cooler, if they were a little bit, you know, if the websites were a little bit better, and God said, it's not the engager, it's not the website. The training guide, that's it. Because there's a training guide in there. It's 86 pages. It's colorful. There's some great videos. Please open it up, read it, dig into it. It will help you overcome the barriers. The whole thing was written to help you overcome the obstacles that are standing in your way of sharing the truth and love of Jesus Christ with those around you. It's a valuable tool. Uh, it came at a high price. We're giving it to you for free. God said, it's not the training guide. <laughs> more money, more creativity, more, what is it? What's the obstacle? God, I'm listening. If prayer alone will remove any obstacle standing in your way, then just show me what the obstacle is. And, and God and I don't normally dialogue like this, like, lest you think that I'm some kind of like a uh, prophet or whatever. But God, did, he did speak with, to me loud and clear. And he said, Marcus, we have everything we need to reach every person on the planet. He said, we have the word of God. We have this spirit of God. But the only thing we lack, the only thing, is the person that will walk across the street and tell somebody about Jesus. And I, it was like I got hit by a truck. And I began to like weep in my seat and I begin to pray to the Lord of the harvest. If he would not send forth laborers into the harvest field, because the fields are white and ripe unto harvest, but the laborers are few. Prayer alone will remove any obstacle. What's the obstacle? It's just the person that will go. The spirit-empowered person that will walk across the street and share the love of Jesus Christ with someone. So I invite you to do the same today. I invite you to join us in prayer prayer for the lost, prayer for the laborer to reach the person that is lost. And don't forget what Luke 10, 3 says, which is therefore go. So real quick, if you'll text the word um, share or, or text the word engage to 97123 or visit that website, you can join our team of over 100,000 volunteers around the world that are sharing the gospel. We'll give you some great resources, and then we want to give you that little um, uh, kit at the end. But uh, how many of you are saying, yes, I'll join with you and I will engage in spiritual conversations? Just raise your hand to say, yes, I want to be a part of this army of believers. Amen. Let me pray for you one more time. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today so that we can, uh, we pray for the laborers. We pray for the harvest field. Lord, we know that it is white and ripe unto harvest, but the laborers are few. Lord, I pray that you would anoint each one of us. Lord, that it's, it's not just about taking cookies to your neighbors, Lord, but it's about taking Jesus Christ to those who are far from you. I pray that you would stir in us a heart for the lost. Break our hearts, Lord, for what breaks yours, Lord, and help us to be moved by God to do what you have called us to do, and that is to take the gospel to the last home on the planet. We can do it in your name. In Jesus, we pray.